All right, so now we are officially recording. So you've missed your opportunity to share your deepest, darkest secrets. So welcome, everybody. Um, I am Anna Hethmaker from Hethmaker Violins. I know that it says Dixie Hethmaker, but that's actually my mom. I'm using her Zoom account. Um, below me, it says Buddy Hethmaker, but that's actually Dixie Hethmaker and my dad. Um, we are from Hethmaker Violins. Most of you guys know the drill by now because this is we've had quite a few classes. We started this program during COVID because all of our favorite, wonderful, beloved adult amateur musicians had all of their musical opportunities canceled for the year. Rehearsals, camps, concerts, and we wanted to do something fun where we could all keep learning. And, um, and so here we are. If you have not checked out the first ser series of videos, we did those before Christmas. There's eight of them. You can find them on the Huffmaker Violins YouTube channel. They are called Classes for the Curious Musician. All of these are recorded. Um, I will have this one up probably tomorrow afternoon sometime. It, it just depends usually when I can get it done. Um, and um, so if you have to duck out, take care of somebody, go eat some dinner or whatever, don't worry. Um, you can come back and catch it tomorrow. So the housekeeping part of it, I told you where it's being recorded. I'm keeping you all muted for the time being, except for, and I will mute myself in a second, except for our clinician. If you have a question, throw it in the chat box and we will, I will throw it to Eric. Um, if I do anything wonky with the sound or anything, raise your hand, throw it in the chat box, let me know. I'm not the most technologically advanced human being on the planet, but I do the best that I can. So we have people come to these from all over the country. So I'm very excited because I have a friend, a violin teacher from Trinidad here tonight, and that's awesome. Um, I do tell everybody, every class, that my favorite thing about this is that I get to hire my favorite musicians that are out there. Um, this does a wonderful thing. This educates the um, people that come to the classes. This gives me an opportunity to share all my friends with you. And it also gives us an opportunity to support professional musicians in a year that hasn't been all that great also. So my favorite musician tonight is my friend, Eric Roberto Salazar. Now his thing says Norman Outlaw, which is not his real name. I will let him tell you more about that, but I will say that he is a rock star freelance musician in New York. And if you've ever had a friend on social media, that they just, not only are they always playing music and always talking about music and always sharing music, but it's always different kinds of music. That is my friend, Eric. Um, his passion for music is bar none, and that's why he's perfect for this. So Eric, I'm gonna turn it over to you and I'm going to mute myself and um, holler at me if you have any questions. Okay, okay, <clears throat> okay. How, um, good evening, everybody. Um, my name is Eric, and I hope um, you enjoy or my talk. But before I do that, I would like to thank Anna and the hot makers, Buddy and uh, Dixie, for the invitation. When I when Anna first uh, he told me about this, she sent me a massive email, and I was like, hmm, that sounds fun. But I was like, no, I don't think I could do that. But then, then she approached me individually, and I said, yes, yes, yes. So. Here I am, I have uh, my a, a, a little special way of thinking and I hope my accent doesn't get you lost or throws you off, but um, I'll try to be as clear as I can. Um, I'm not gonna do as much playing as I wanted to because I told the nurse to put the vaccine on this side, but she did it on this side. So, so far I'm not feeling anything, but it just feels like somebody gave me a, I need a point, but it's good. I could still play. So let's get started with basic, the basics of violin. So what can we call a basic? So the definition of basic is forming an essential foundation or starting point, a fundamental, or the essence, the essential factors or principles of a subject or a skill. Now, Every time 
when I approached a music class or student in really, whether it's public school or private, I always ask what is that they want to do? And because I want to see, I, want, I would like to see what is that they want to work and what they know, what they don't know. And most of the time they don't tell you, you know, or of course they all go to YouTube and learn how to hold the ball this way or this way. And I even saw somebody holding the ball like, like a Chinese air or something. And they think they know it all. And then when they, when we have, to, when I have to begin to work and correct stuff, then I begin to get, I'm, I'm, I'm the bad person. And I'm just gonna tell you a short story. Not too long ago, I have a student that she came to me because the mother wanted her to play violin for fun. Then she said, oh, I want her to join Jude Symphony and Middle School Orchestra. And what is the first thing they ask you to play? Scales and arpeggios. So I said, we had, and we had to read music. So we, start, we got started and then something happened and she fractured her wrist. So she couldn't play for five months straight. When she came back, everything was good. And she began, she, we were going slowly, but surely and she was doing perfectly. And all of a sudden the mother says, Eric, we got to talk. And she said to me, but in a tone, and she said, I'm sick, I'm tired of hearing the same darn song. This has to change. I can't take this no more. This, and what was the song she's playing? Do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, ti, do, do, si, la, sol, fa, mi, re, do, do, mi, sol, do, mi, sol, do, do, do. Scales on arpeggios. So how, when she told me this, she took 30 minutes of the lesson to explain and fight about this, that why she's playing these things over and over, which is a baby exercise. Why can't she play songs by Justin B by the Justins, Justin Bieber, Justin Timberlake, and whoever else is singing or playing or something? And I'm like, and I said, hold on a second. So I actually walked out, went and got a coffee, came back, and I just very di diplomatically said to her that since they don't trust my musical judgment, it was time to go. And she lost it. I mean, she was screaming and carrying on. And then but what really made me take that decision was because the, the child didn't, she, she said that I told her that she should only practice five minutes in, uh, every day. So do you imagine five minutes? But anyhow, so to continue with the basic stuff, I want to read something to you that I discovered. And it's like, why do we have to practice skills? And he reads, practicing skills and arpeggios plays an essential part in developing a player's skills. Time devoted to this exercise within this practice session will improve many aspects of techniques such as coordination, string crossing, ball control, position changes, and tone production. In addition, the sense of key and pattern acquired through familiarity of scales and arpeggios has several benefits. It speed of the learning of new pieces, builds oral awareness, increases familiarity with the geography of the instrument, but more the fingerboard, and help develop fine intonation, evenness of line and quality of tone. When I got, when, most of, I have students from the youngest is two and a half and the oldest is maybe pushing almost 90. And they all come and they, everybody wants to play. Everybody wants to, you know, enjoy themselves playing music. But when it comes to basics, they just don't want to hear about it. And I think it shouldn't be that way because it's just like we drink water, we breathe without drinking water, without breathing, and without the heart pumping blood all over our body, we won't be alive. So I usually, let me turn my here. This is my, my German Stradivarius, as I call it. Um, so the first thing when I, when, when I ask, a student is, you know, of course we work on the ball hold and this and that and the other, which many people come to and start playing. When they do the twinkle. 
you know, the whole nine yards. So when I start telling them about the ball hole and why and this and the other, and I begin to see that they have no idea of the coordination that has to be between the left hand and the right hand. So you could play. Otherwise, like a lot of people, and this is the um, most in Suzuki, I see students when they come to me, they come and they do. That's what I call violin hiccups. So they don't, they do not. Ricky. So they do not understand the concept of, um, how can I say, string crossings. For example, like you have your, the E is the first floor, second floor, third floor. So I have this exercise that I kind of, Ricky, excuse me. What? I know this will gonna happen. So, so I make this exercise that they, when they play, they pluck. They pluck first. Let's, let's do four A's, four E's, two A's, two E's, one A, one E, one A. But you have to, you know, keep the beat. Like for example, you get one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, one, two. One A, one E, one A. And while you're doing that, you, I'm, I, at the same time, I'm correcting you know, the, the posture and all this stuff. And later, you just begin to do the same thing with the ball. But you do everything again, D, A, and E, D, and A, G, and D. So you just do this. And this is the very first thing when I have a group, especially the group classes where you have to unify criteria because some people know something and some people don't know anything. So to make them all play together, you just you stop and you roll to the E. You stop, you roll to the A, then you do two A. You stop, you roll to the E, then you do two E. You stop, you roll, you do one A. Stop, roll E. Stop, roll. E. So and we and I stick to that for a while until they feel comfortable, and then we begin to do the every two strings, A and E, D and A, and G and D. By the time, you feel, yes. Hey, so what did you say earlier when you were talking about those string cross? You said first floor, second, third floor, third floor. Oh, you have the, the the angle, the angle. That's the word that I wanted to see. The angles of the voice. See, you play on the E string, A string. D string, G string, because when they play twinkle, they just do. And so when they do, so instead of, so when you play twinkle, you should start playing. So that way, in that in, within that space that you're not playing, that's where you move the the ball, you roll the ball from A to the E string or the E to the A, and you put the fingers up and down. So you define every single movement instead of just you know they're playing almost like like they're playing manager. Yeah. So do you do you understand that concept? Yeah. So you're talking about coordination. Yes, exactly. Coordination. The time, well, I call it multi timing, but they they get it because the same thing. I also let them play a cello song called French folk song. So it's the same idea. You do. So in between those spaces, that's when you move the fingers up and down, and then it, it's it's a very good thing to to work that. Um, coordination from the beginning. And then I don't like to tell them to dig into the string yet, but pull the sound. Um, see, it's, there's one thing that I, um, how can I explain? Oh, now, for so you to understand this, my first instrument was clarinet for like 15, and, and I still play. I cannot play like 
Benny Goodman now, but if I practice, you know, but I have, I will have to start practicing this to play clarinet. Well, anyhow, my first teacher used to make me do long notes, super long notes, like eight beats, and then you have to take a big cast of air and then give very even note. So the same, and then while he's playing all this, he we playing as in a duet. So you have to join not only the tone, but also listen to what he's doing and kind of like just play this whole tone. So for us, it will translate into sans filet. If you don't know what sans filet is, it's spun tone, which was the invention of somebody called Lucien Capet. And I'll tell you about it. Remind me about Lucien Capet in a second. Anyhow, so when you do long tones on the violin, so filet, it's you just try to play as close to the bridge as you can, no pressure, super relaxed, and you should be able to feel the vibrations of the string on the bow if you hold the bow correctly. And that works for cello, bass, viola, anything. So you. Now, of course, this is, I haven't played today at all. So this is, so I'm, so I'm get trembling and you're gonna get a lot of trembling, lots of ugly sounds, but the more you practice that way and you pull the sound, the better and the quality. I hope the bar also is not driving you crazy. It's, so you see, and then little by little, then you just do. And it really helps you to control the ball. I discovered after so many years that if you do not become good buddies with this little fellow over here, you have so much trouble. I started with a couple of major teachers and they all concentrated on the left hand, but there was one that took me and this took every single piece that I was playing and we begin to do some fillet from this, from scratch to pull the sound because I was already, you know, pulling, you know, digging and so forth. And once this violin is, uh, just so you know, every time a major violinist that I like comes in town, I harass them to the hotels and I sit down, I drive them to coffee and I sit down with them and talk. What is that you do? You know, <laughs> just, what is your secret? And once, I don't remember, he was a French violinist and he, I don't speak much French, but I did one year of French, you know, to Jim Appel, Eric, and so forth. So we began to talk and everything. He played Beethoven in Carnegie, Carnegie Hall with somebody. And, but the sound, I found the sound amazing. I, and, and the orchestra was playing so loud that he could project that instrument like, like an eagle across the hall. And you could see him playing normal, but all, usually you see somebody, you know, working so hard. This guy was just in heaven with the ball. So I went and I found him. And so I took him to eat and he said to me, every two minutes he would say, Lucien Capet, Lucien Capet, Lucien Capet. I was like, well, I know who Lucien Capet is. But then he said, and he started doing some exercises, controlling the ball, like the same spawn tone that I did. But well, you see how you play thirds on the piano, like one, three, two, four, one, three, two, four. He was doing the same thing while doing quarter notes, like without disturbing the sound of the ball. That blew me away. I, and then he was doing some crazy things while, while he was still blowing the ball this way. And you will see him doing all these crazy things with it. And then we say goodbye and I gave him my address. Two weeks later, I get a book or an old book, La Technique du Larchet by Lucien Capet. If you haven't seen this book, you are in for a trick. Superior Bow Technique. So here am I trying to translate this French book with all these exercises and I was like- oh, Hey, Eric, I'm hold there. that up again so I can type the name in the chat box for everyone. Yeah. Lucien Capet. Spell the last name for me. C-A-P-E-T. Thank you. 
So Stephen Ships, who is a um, was a teacher uh, at Indiana University, and Mark H. Schmidt translated the book. So, and it it's really, if you think sepsis is terrible and hard, wait till you see this. But the, the, I don't I, I don't say that you don't you shouldn't be using it. It's a pretty important technique. But it has it, it is so specific of what to do, how the quality of sound, the preliminary. I mean, he uses he. I'm gonna show you something here. Um, see this here. Like he he divides the ball and on the exercises in half quarters, eight, and then he has specific things on the things that you have to do with the ball. Um, this is something that needs to be explained by an expert. I, to, I don't consider myself an expert on this, but it is good to know. And every now and then, the one thing I do every single morning when I want to play, and actually I, ca I have caught some very big names, which I prefer not to mention them, but I know one, Anna Sophie Mutter. What does she do when she goes to, to start warming up? And she, she does a lot of sepsis, which is another thing that I wanted to talk about. Now, the left, the, the coordinate, and, and once you control the ball and you know how to pull the sound, I think, and you become very, very good friends with your ball, things on the left hand will flourish, you know, like a flower. Um, what is all the... Uh, 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 uh. Oh, there's another exercise that I don't see a lot of people know about it, but when I went to this teacher, he says to me, oh, you need to do your shifting needs work. And he gave me this. He didn't give me this, I found it. This, if you didn't have heard about Yoast, if you ever dream of studying with Perlman or, Juliet, you're gonna do a lot of Yoast. And it is not other, what it tells is a little test to your um, patients. But you see, it works, shifts, every single shift that you could possibly think. First to third, first to fifth, to seven to eight. And all you do is, <laughs> Ricky, stop. See, first to second. You And it, it really makes you realize and learn the fingerboard in a different way instead of jumping. I think, and I tell my students to, I prefer to think of skating through the strings when you shift as opposed to jump. See, like instead of doing to, let me, let me think of something simple. Just a little shift like. See, instead of doing, they do, they jump instead of. And you need to practice this as the um, person who wrote it, Joe's uh, the man that you need to practice this extremely slowly. And then I feel that you need some work with, um, oh, before I go into uh, this other thing, but I need to go and get some books which I forgot to bring here. Scales, when the scale things comes in, a lot of people don't like, they think it's just baby's exercises. As a clarinet player, I did so many scales and arpeggios. So when I went, when I started violin at age 16, which a lot of people didn't want me to do, Including my mother, <laughs> which I don't want, but eventually she gave up and I just did what I had to do. Um, I think scales is the one thing that will set you free. Scales and uh, mostly arpeggios. And I'll explain now, I believe more in arpeggios than the scales. 
when the pandemic started, I was so disciplined, whether it was first violin, second violin, concert mastering, or viola. And in a couple instances, cello. But I'm not a cellist. <laughs> uh, but of course, there were whole notes and in easy key. So um, the first week, I was like, okay, you know, this is going to be last thing, maybe like two months. Little did we know that we were going to be more than a year. So I was just watching TV every single day. Like there was, like I had never seen TV. It was either Blue Bloods or La uh, Order uh, SVU, all these programs. So, but a student called me and I was teaching some students via someone I said, oh, well, you know, it's Eric, you know, I practice. Every time the commercials comes on, I practice. I'm like, oh, that's not a bad idea. So I took the advice. So every time the commercial was on, you know, without rushing, you say, I would just. And I would practice my scales up and down and then commercials over and we continue watching. And I began to do that for a week. Little did I know that after a week, things that I, have, that I haven't played in years, like Frank Sonata, uh, Handel Sonata, um, what the other piece? Uh, a lot of pieces that I didn't call it, Don Borja, Sonatina, all this stuff begin to come in my, into my fingers that I haven't played in years. And the facility of Brooke Mendelssohn, I have, oof, I have years that I haven't done that. So I decided to do this. And every day I wrote what I practice. So the first one, you see, every day I would write, of course, it's a little difficult to understand my, my, my crazy handwriting, but you see scales, arpeggios, blah, blah, blah. And I feel it's important because you need to practice with a purpose. If you just practice to practice whatever, you are not going to accomplish anything. Even though I was not thinking of accomplish anything, but then I decided, you know something, I cannot allow myself just to sit back and let this pandemic just let all the skills that I worked so hard to get and just let it off um, dissipate in the air. So I began, so little by little, I really got inspired and began to watch some people on, on, online, people from Europe were giving master classes and teaching and this and that. So I came, I continued just doing scales on our pages for like three weeks, nothing else, just scales on our pages. And at the end, I will play a little something, something, you know, so the one piece, one piece that I haven't played in years. Oh my God, I, I, was, I was like in shock when it just came to my head. It just like came back to me. It was like, oh, this is not bad. So I can, I continue practicing, um, but now a little more intense, a little more like more arpeggios and then um, I have to go through a little setup change because in 2013, I was feeling, you know, you're busy teaching school, the, uh, um, orchestra, running here to the gate, to the, whether it was jazz, Latin, and salsa, or at Carnegie Hall with some major artists. Um, and you didn't have time to do anything. So, and to keep yourself just Playing, 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 playing. So I was feeling like so tight. Like I was like, I could not play. I, I was I was playing and I was making the gigs in the morning, but I was not feeling, I, the feeling was like I was in, thrown in a box and just like in a wood box, you know, and I was like so tight. So I had to think over and I said, well, let me just begin to work on this stuff again on the very basic. So. Of course, when I started playing violin, I was as thin as this bow. Now, when you get older, you put on weight and so forth. So of course, the shoulder rest that I used to use before, the kun was not working. The chin rest that I had before, which was like, they call the Anna Sophie Mutter. Uh, you can tell that Anna Sophie Mutter is my platonic wife. Actually, let me show you a picture real quick. I tell you, she is, 
Don't laugh at this picture, please. This is when she did her uh, Carnegie Hall recital. So, so she, but I, somehow she has played, changed her, her playing a little bit, but anyway, I, I adore. So I was playing, you know, the Anna and it was not working for me. So I went to this guy and I told him this, I seen you playing, I know you started with delay and, 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 and your uncle is uh, sorry with Galamian and blah, 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 blah. So, it's, and, so I told him and I oh, look up to this guy. So he took me as a student and then we begin to work. We didn't play no concertos, we didn't play no big pieces, just lines of back, little things here and there, but work on the ergonomics of the, of the, of the setup and the posture. So I was already playing like this. Right. So first thing first, he made me drop the shoulders, see, natural. And then he made me experiment with different shoulder wrists, but then she moved back to Pennsylvania. And of course, I was not going to go to Pennsylvania for no lesson. And, but at least he, but he did help me find that setup that will work for me. So, but at least I have now, more, um, uh, he conducted me in the right direction. So then I began to experiment and I changed the shoulder, uh, the shin rest. This is, I think it's a Baroque kind of shin rest, but this is the one shop here in, in New York was charging me like $80 for something like this. This cost me 18 euros across the pond in a store called String King, which in a moment, I'm gonna, later at the end, I'm gonna talk to you about a little thing about basic cases and stuff. So at first, when I saw this, I was like, hmm, let me just try this up. When I first tried it, I tell you, I felt liberated. Okay, so it's, and then I bought this, um, there is a shoulder rest called arc rest that comes with a, um, a balsa wood base and you just, and they just give you like different thicknesses of, of sponges. Like this is the middle one. So for some reason, one of my students took the, 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 the base and I put this back and I played it while I had this. And I was like, this is it. After this, I could play. I tell you, it was so shady. I didn't have to work hard. Just... Sorry. I mean, I could go back and forth before it was like, you know, and I didn't feel comfortable. So, hey, what was the name of that um, shoulder rest again? Arc rest, like arc, like arc, and rest. Now okay. they made them. And now they it's very, it's very good. You it, it, and it had and it helps in this with the sound. But this works for me. So I think I'm, I won't go back to any other. Um, another thing that I changed well, the shoulder, the chin rest uh, is from a shop called. Um, String King, it's, I think it's either in Nor, no, not Norway, it's a, I think Sweden or Poland, one of those two, but I'll come back to that in a second. So this, I think it's also important that you find something that you need to think of as a basic is comfort. If you do not feel comfortable with a violin, you need to try it. You, I, I um, can talk enough about students buying instruments on Walmart one student came for with a 29.99 violin from Walmart. The violin, when I saw the violin, I was like, and the pegs, I, I, I cannot describe it, but when I when, when, when I saw the bow, I tell you, it looked like somebody just took a wood out of this window and just like, like shaped it into a bow shaped object. It was terrible. So, the first thing I said, don't buy anything on eBay. Just ask around. Go to a violin shop like Hotmakers. I will fly to Hotmakers to buy my stuff. Whenever That's I get an money. excellent idea. Yes. I asked somebody who knows. Ask around. Same thing with repairs. I, I Once I did, so this happened to me. Um, I had a little crack right here on the top. And I couldn't go to my main guy in New Jersey. So I went somewhere else and it, took, it was a ship repair, but it cost me dearly. And everybody's like, what's wrong with your violin? It sounds like it's muted. 
when I heard that, and then five months, and I'm drawing, I'm working, and the violin sounds like, like you have a, a, a mask on, on, and people were complaining. And when customers are complaining that your sound is no good, you got to go back and do something about it. So I went to my the main guy who brought this back to life, and I didn't tell him anything. As soon as he looked at it, you know, he knows his thing. He's like, I don't know what he listens for, but he, he and then he said, what do you took this violin to? So whoever did this, they don't know what they're doing. <laughs> And he got so mad at me. He said, why didn't you just come to me? And I said, well, because I, and I had to pay you for, for you. But yeah, what do you know? You could have paid me in payment. So don't go, don't bring your, your little precious jewel to just the first shop you see around the corner. Take the time, like Whoopi said, to enjoy the view, but ask around and ask people and, and, and that have taken the, the, the violin somewhere or anything. And especially with the ball. That's another thing. If you have a really good ball, also to just, just go to ball queen. Anyway, so the basic, another thing that I consider basic is how you take care of your instrument. I mean, of course, we all have a nice instrument. I, I'm totally, this is a German Paul Knorr, K N O W R. I'm not so sure exactly where it was made, but according to somebody in Philadelphia, it was made in the 30s. And so this person was willing to give me, in the after conference, he offered me, he almost offered me $5,000 cash just to get it. I was like, this is mine. But I've been investigating and looking for instruments of the same maker, and they're all in the 20s. And 25, 20, 10,000. So I guess this is worth you know, something. But uh, like Rene, I took it once to Rene Morel and I took, I, had, I used to have like five violins and he asked me and I, told, I asked him, so which one should I keep? Is this the one you have to keep? Well, he said he wanted me to, to save at least $4,000 and he would take care of it, but I didn't have that. You know, when you go to college, you don't have money. You know? Well, anyhow. One more thing that I would say, where do you keep your instrument? A lot of people don't talk about cases. Now, there is one brand that I would love to talk to you about, but I can't because once we start the recording, maybe I'll tell you, but let me show you the one that I recently discovered. Now, this is, this, is when you put the balls, this is real carbon fiber, not plastic, okay? And then very good to fly. People don't give you headaches, don't give me headaches when I fly. Very good. And you see, you put the violin right here. I saw somebody running on a, uh, in Chicago, running at the airport. And I was like, I run to see who was this person. And so, where do you got that cake? And he said, Trinity, Trinity, Trinity. And I'm like, Trinity. So I went online and I said, yes, Trinity by travel violin case. And you'll see it. It's a little pricey, but for me, it's, you know, it's work. It's very small, but it keeps your instrument warm and in, in, in good shape. Um, there is one more thing. Also, any questions? Do you have guys any questions about what to practice later? Yeah, wait, if you want, I, just, gonna... I have a quick question. So, yes. because and and um, I know it's not about playing, y'all. I'm sorry, but you just mentioned flying with your instrument. So, your bow is that a horn frog? What kind of what what is your frog made out of? So that's horn. I think, yeah, I think I think this is fake. Okay, they, that's okay. They, I just wondered if you ever tried to fly with ivory or anything like that. Yeah, it looks like. Yeah, yeah this is the first. This I won this in a raffle at the Asta conference. In the first, the first Asta conference I went, I won this as a raffle. So, <laughs> but it's a good boy. I really liked it. Um, so do you have any any questions? Any ideas? There are so many suggestions that I have about what to practice about so far as technique and exercises and. Um, actually, can, if I can jump in, um, one of my friends emailed me 
today and asked me to ask you, she is struggling. Um, she's a fairly new player and she's playing with a small ensemble of other new players, but she's struggling with the rhythm, with, with being able to play with other people and finding the beat. Do you have any advice for, for newer musicians learning rhythm and learning the beat? Hold on, he's muted. Why are you muted? Unmute yourself. <laughs> now, can you hear me now? Yeah, okay. now we can hear you. Um, I would say sing. And I say, and I tell you why singing. In public schools, and some of my adults really, I call them the, the third generation of twink, twinklers, as they call themselves. Um, Think of the Suzuki method for a moment. Not so much Suzuki, but the way we all grow up. You don't start talking. Uh, I'm sorry. You don't start writing and creating sentences and writing essays immediately. You start talking little words, little songs, and little by little. So, and by that, I mean when you start playing, you should do the same. Um, now, when I went to Berkeley, I did not graduate from Berkeley, but I went, I spent like five consecutive summers, five or five, like two months during summertime. And they encouraged you to sing and talk the rhythm. And this is where solfege also helps. People don't make the connections. I don't understand when in here in the US and um, many, many places too, they de separate music theory, solfege with the, the, with the instrument because it really helps. Because if you really pay attention in Indian culture, which I took a course of Indian music too, and Miss Vaida, uh, uh, Kavita, what's her name? She would not make me, this is way before cell phones, so, you know, so. She make me tagarina, pagarina, padarina, padarina, and you and you count and you do all these things way before you even touch the instrument. You have to be able to sing those scales and raise and sing this. So if you want to work in rhythm, you need to think like a rapper. Like, no, I don't know how to rap, but um, like a poet. Yes, if you say like. Pepperoni pizza, pepperoni pizza, and this 16, 16, 8, no, 16, 16, 8, no. Just put words to the rhythm that makes sense. Um, there is a, um, I forgot the name of the, this, this one of my students um, showed me this video game, and I cannot, I cannot remember right now, but he has a little rap, and he was having so much trouble, and he said, then when he put the rhythms, with something related to um, Hamilton, he got it. So you just need to put, you need to find something. For example, if you have this. Uh, I don't wanna go, but I do like, you know, just invent, create something. And this is what brings me to the video that I wanted you to play. Just watch this video for a moment. All right, let me, oh, and um, let me give you guys a little bit of a heads up. I turned on the closed captioning, but it's not real closed captioning. It's fake Google, so there's some weird words. So let's see if you can hear this. Oh, wait. I told y'all I wasn't very good at this. Can you see it now? No. Can you see a, an older man playing the violin? Oh, wait. There you go. All right. Now. What kind of advice would you give to a young violinist now? That's why I would, couldn't say better than the hour said to me. What did he say? Don't practice, don't think with your hand, but you do with your brain. But you said something about not going to, a, after a certain amount of time, once you know how to play the violin, you should do what? Invent anything. Anything you invent, actually. If somebody doesn't know what invention means, you should stop violently. 
I can, you can't explain everything. <laughs> Howard didn't explain to me. He didn't tell you how to do it. That means it's also not practicing only. Think how to achieve quality. Practicing doesn't achieve quality. You achieve quality only when you do it without opposition or give difficulty. Because the difficulty, difficulty opposes you possibility of doing better. Tell me, what's the most difficult piece you ever played? Was that was that what you wanted to show? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, and the reason I want when very super long time ago when we all were using VHS, this video came out, and the name of the video is now it's available in DVD. It's Master of Invention. If you haven't watched this, you have to watch this. You will see Pinka Superman a little bit drunk, but it's good. You know, what they talk is very important. I remember when I was starting playing violin, um, somebody gave me a record with this old man in the picture and people like, what are you listening? What's that man singing? Everybody do, you know, you go to school and you see people like they want, you want to have like Madonna records and stuff. And then here I come with Nathan Milstein, Back Chapon or D minor partita. And when I heard that D minor partita, the whole thing, I tell you, I was like mesmerized by the quality and the musicianship and everything. So I was, I began to watch him. And plus, um, way back in the days, there was a book called Great Masters of the Violin. If you can get it, your hands on it, it's excellent. It tells you the whole story about violinists and and the bow and where it came from and Corelli and so forth. But Nathan Milstein talks about, and Pinka Zuckerman too, about inventing new ways of doing stuff. The person that I studied for almost a year and a half uh, in 2013 to get out of my rotten, not so good technique, I he started with Zuckerman and Delay and they, I have a problem Technically, that when I get too emotional with the piece, I, it gets on the way of my playing. So Superman always talks about listen to your sounds, not your emotions. And if you really begin to look at it, it's like people say that Heifetz, you look looks cold when you play. But when you see him performing, you see he may not move too much or, or smile, like crack a smile when he's playing. But if you listen to the intensity of the sound, the quality, I never heard him live, I'm not saying to video. If I could pick two violinists, three violinists that I could that I could meet in person and bring him back to life would be Chrysler, Heifetz, and Jeanette Never. That's another one that you have to, she plays, there's a video that she opened her eyes like, crazy but but the playing you know the sound they make is amazing and then back to Milson he talks about creating your own exercises like don't play the same scale do re mi fa sol la ti do do re mi fa you, just you get tight so if you play for example a G major you just put some juice in there There are so many ways that you could play scales or, or you never know when you're going to need to play all these down, 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 or up, 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 up. You need to practice like my uh, last person that I studied that I also adore. I, she passed away two years ago, Nina Bailina. She was the closest I ever got to David Oyster. And she gave me this book of scales. Elisabetta Gilel, you see, there's a, uh, she does the wife of the pianist, uh, Emil Gilel's Russian. Now, these scales are, look at this. And when you see people from Russia, when they play scales and they make it so solid, I tell you, you have to, there's so many stuff that we don't do here that we need to get 
ready to play. Now, Nina will make me play scales. No, he said, Americans like to play scales just down up. You need to practice coming from the top note to the bottom note. So instead of doing this, like, <laughs> See, she will not make me do it. She will make. So you go G, F, G, F, E, and you go back and you keep every single time you come back and not going down, but you need to come from the tap note, not from low. Um, Low G, so it's it, and the same thing with the arpeggios. You play instead of oops, sorry, you go you know, you constantly go, you go one note, um, lower every single time, and then the time that you practice. Me and her would spend so much time in the morning after we have breakfast, we have kasha and tons of espresso. And then we, she start doing her scales on, on that book. And after 30 minutes, I couldn't keep up with her. She will go like for at least an hour and a half, just scales, thirds, six, tens, and all this crazy stuff. And even though she had small hands, the way she worked and managed technique, she would not tense up. She would, I would put my hands on top of her and it was like a, just a piece of rubber, just like if somebody's, very delicate touch. So tension is another thing that you have to be very careful with, which I, it almost cost me my thumb some years ago from trying to play Paganini and do all these stretches and stuff. So, um, and then also find somebody that you trust, you find around teachers that you want to, you know, you want to study with and don't be afraid. The, the, if you ask, if I ask an Asupi Mutter, then I want to study with you. The, what's the, last, the worst thing she could tell me? No, you know, but, but you, you ask and, and study with somebody. At some point, you need to be your own teacher. Like once Isaac Stern, um, I only had one talk with him. I met him once and I, I tell you, I almost have a heart attack. I didn't know what to say. And he said to me, you need to practice with the pianist a lot. When you, because I was, at the time I was in college and I was doing Frank Sonata. So he said, you better practice with the pianist because if you don't have a good pianist, the pianist can break you and blah, 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 blah. But, but I guess, but I, but I love music and I feel that you, I refuse to be put in a box, for example. And what I mean with it, in a box. A lot of people say, "Oh, you're a classical musician. You you know you are no, you you can create." And I'm like, "Oh yes, I can. I could play by ear. Like when you go to now, the reality of musicians is that orchestra. You know the situation with orchestras all over. So the best gig ever that you can get at this moment is church. Now, when you go to church, whether it's a Baptist church or uh, evangelist, it doesn't matter what church. When the Holy Spirit comes down and the music director tells you violin solo, you better improvise. You cannot tell you, oh, I don't know. What scale is that piece on? If you ask that question, be guaranteed that they will not call you again. So this is the reason why you have to know your skills. And at first, when I began to play in this um, uh, gospel situation, you know, there's a lot of things that you don't know what's going to happen. So you need to play, and most of these choir things in flat keys. So you need to know your flat key, D flat, E flat minor, all this. And actually, it's still very nice to work. You just need to um, discover. Every day you need to discover something on the instrument. Like for example, one day I hate this Suzuki piece, which I'm going to play for you. Really, the way I play in the morning. <laughs> Let's play you away. So that sound familiar? So that's in A major. So if you want to get into keys, 
you practice perpetual motion and you play your scale. And then you play the same thing in D major. And you go. And so forth. Then you go into G major. Now, you start playing the same perpetual motion in B flat in one octave. So, and you play the same perpetual motion. Now, with this fingering, you could play anywhere on the fingerboard. Anywhere. It doesn't matter where, as long as you use, start with the first finger. So with this, I start teaching my students with, um, this is B flat, so then you can transfer it to the D scale, the D and the A string with D, uh, E flat. A flat. Then you could do B major. And you still do the same to L. And position changes and the same, the whole nine yards. I had a student that has, um, uh, she was playing Vivaldi Four Seas uh, Spring. She said, and she was playing, you know, all this. So what did I give her? And, and it works. You just have to find a way to do, invent new things. For me, that was a reality, a, a, a big um, thing because when you start people in Suzuki, you stay in A major for a very long time. And then when you want to go to D and G major, kids don't want to play, you know, it's, it's, it's difficult. But if you work on this, and I've say, I'll show you where I got, where I got that from, and it's, it's like a revelation. Yes. All right. So I hear you talking a lot about um, making up stuff, being creative with your practice, trying a lot of different stuff. So what do you tell people, though, when they're so used to just that printed page? They've never left the page. They're taught to only do what's on the page. How do you encourage them to be brave? Well, before you break the rules, you have to learn the rules. So you have to play what's on the paper first, straight up, and then you can play. There was a student that was going to play. She was worried because she wanted to play something for like her nonna, the, the Italian grandmother. And she didn't have no pizza song or pasta song, or so I don't know. And then I said, well, you tell me what song you want to play. I said, but we were working on perpetual motion. So I told, I told her, so this is what she ended up playing. So, And I don't like it. Or you go, if you want to go Latin. Or if you want to go, one of my students, I say, can you invent a rhythm that nobody ever played with twinkle? You know, everybody plays the same. And this is what he came up with. Uh, And then twinkle was nobody played twinkle was like you, you just or to, I, I'm trying to do one twin um it, like create one like in five four like one two one two three one two one two three or one you know you have to create some rhythm but I, I still haven't come up with it but but yeah just just you need to play what's on the paper first and then you begin to mess around with it. But it, it's worth messing around. Also something that not too many teachers like to do, but for shifting, it helps. Scales with one finger.
You see, in Indian music, you use a lot of so shifting. If, if, if you work, and also the, there was another book that I don't have that I just discovered, and it's called Gola. It's a, the, it's a contemporary of uh, Shepsi, but uh, I, I don't know why I never heard of that book, Gola, G-O-L-A. The best shifting exercise book that I have seen. I was going to show you, but I left it in the other room. But I and I just got them today from Southwest. I think it was the cheapest place you could buy them from. But they have this exercise that um, similar to the Rismali um, scales. But for if you want to talk about scales, Jesus, you could put. There are so many books that you could use that is. Unbelievable, but my, my, my most favorite ones are Flesh. Also, this one, Isai. It's a, Isai is a very important name that you need. If you play violin, you have to know who this man is. This is another one that I would have loved to see him play his stuff live. Now, so the met, Suzuki method used a little bit of the stuff in this book. This book for many years was out of print. One of my students went to London and bought it for me. And, um, but now it's available in the US. Um, it's short, it's just like 16 pages, but 16 pages of, but whatever you decide to do, I think the most important thing is to have so much technique that you don't have to think about it. If you are too conscious of the how, I think it, it can make playing almost impossible. Just have any activity, like if you think too much, like, like, oh, I'm gonna drink water, but I'm gonna take this tap off at this speed and then put it in my mouth at this angle. You know, just drink the water. You know, simple, simplify. Now, the other big advice that I that I have discovered, I don't like to practice, and I don't like to say opening like this. That is. Like just spend, like Natal Mason said, like when you spend too much time without thinking and feeling what you're doing, don't play. But if you are practice, if you want to practice to accomplish something, you know, like for example, you want to play today because you want to get that chord in the, the or, 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 or you know, so like you're playing, for example. Oh, sorry. You see, sometimes we, we get to... So when you practice this kind of stuff, you need to master your bow and you need to kind of play super on the speed. Like if I want to play that chord, it's not so much about coming down the street, but more horizontal. If you see Perman played, Bach is like out of this world, you know? So you need to practice a lot of, take it out of context. Instead of doing, like for example, if you need to practice this. If you want to get that chord, you need to practice. So a little, the ball a little tilted, and then when you get to here, then you go back here. So, but you see, I'm, I have a, a, a little trembling. So you need to have your fingers very relaxed and and just. And then little by little, then you, See, and then little by little you take, so you take the things out of context and just play open string and master the open strings. Okay, quick question. So, cause you've said the R word about 50 times, which is relax. So how, what advice do you have for us when we're really tight and we're holding on to everything? Sometimes it seems impossible to relax. The moment, um, the moment uh, 
you begin to tighten up, you need to just put the violin down and do something totally different. Your practice session, your mind can concentrate just for a very small amount of time. And if you practice with your absent mind that you're going to get it, you think you may advance or anything, but it's just a waste of time. So I will say practice five to 10 minutes and take a five minute break and stretch and do all this stuff with the fingers and then come back to it slower. And then also you need to practice in slow gear. Don't practice, for example, now mind you, I haven't practiced today. This is like my first plane today. I, I went to get my shot. For example, if you're gonna play. You see, I'm playing a little bit out of tune, of course, but too loud. You see, just. One so he came to me and he wanted to play this for an audition and he only had four weeks. And he was like, I was like, that's not it. It's... So you need to practice a lot of. And you need to change the rhythm a little bit. Like... Or... But you need to slow down and practice softer and just walk through the piece, relax, and then little by little you'll bring it back up. Otherwise, once once you get tense and it, and you don't control that, you're in trouble. Well, that's a perfect example of what you just played because what Karen just said in the chat box, and it totally is how I feel. She says it's hard not to grip the neck when the music's hard, when you're really concentrating. Yeah, so that's why you need to have kind of independence of left and right hand. For that independence um, of hands, I would suggest, I don't have the book. Uh, you see, I have, a, imagine my, some of my former teachers calls me, it's like, do you have the, the, the piano part for the Schirmer edition of Frank Sonata or, or, or the Patent Writer or this and that? Because if I have it, you know, if they, if they know it exists, they know I have it. So, um, but I have somebody, I learned it Dunis. They made uh, I forget his first name. Demetrios Dunis. He has some crazy exercises called the dust, the 12 dozen or the daily dozen exercises. I will practice some of those super slow. Of course, they're gonna tire your hand a little bit, but they're very, very, very good. How do also you spell that? Dunis, do D-O-U-N-I-S. The daily, I think it's on. I, if you if you look at it on um, IMSLP, it's it's in there. The twelve, the daily dozen exercises, and um, what's the other one? The do donuts and oops, something just slipped off my head. Yeah, but you, and that's why scales, slow practice scales pay off big time because when you control your bow playing skills and your arpeggios and you begin to play with as many different bowing variations as you can in different parts of the bow, um, it makes you more aware of uh, this, uh, the bar uh, barrage of skills that you can have with the bow. So when you begin and you apply them into the music, then it's like, oh, this is not so obvious because many students, I have lost students because I ask them to keep repeating and work on the on the stuff, but they think that I'm just want to just make them repeat just to repeat. It's like it's not it's not that. It's just imagine one student came in, in a week and he said, So what what piece do you want to play? So I want to play Paganini Caprice number five. And I was like, and I said, brother, not even if you practice 24 hours in a month. In three months, you cannot play that piece. You need there's something that needs to happen and be in place before you do that. Uh, and I also um, encourage people to uh, once you have the right technique, like I said, 
it's important that you can have so much technique. You, the more technique you practice, the more your skills, the more there's the, um, uh, so what is this book? I don't know, any, I know I don't have it in front of me, uh, but the more you, the more technique you have, and they also so fresh, spend a little time so fresh. I remember as five-year-old boy back in Panama, you had to do uh, the solfege of all solfege. You had to write C major chord. There was no piano, but you need to know what a C major chord looks like. And you had to write in the music and everything. And then the teacher gave you the solfege. And you do, ti, do, re, mi, do, re, mi, re, do, si, do, ti, do, re, mi. So when I went to college, you know, the, the movable dog became a little of a problem, but then I had to retrain my brain to stop thinking because of the clarinet. I was thinking everything in B flat. So it was like, oh my God, what is this? But, but it really pays off when you do so fresh. And if you bring, for example, a phrase that you don't want, you don't know how to um, approach, sing. All right, Dion wants to know if you have any ideas for a relax, any tips for a relaxed vibrato. Yes. It's not, um, I don't know why I saw this, but uh, my former Nina Belina, she used to tell me that when she was in Russia and she was, I think eight years old, she needed to play Shostakovich, no, Tchaikovsky for some competition. And he was like below zero, I don't know, it was so cold. And she said, <clears throat> she couldn't vibrate. So she said she put the violin like a shell. And then she just put one finger at a time, nice and relaxed with the tip. And then you just one finger, two fingers, three fingers, four fingers. And that way you also <clears throat> let you get some calluses, which are very necessary. But then that gives you the exact direction of the vibrato because a lot of people, like this student, and I'm not kidding you, this kid came playing La Folia like this. I mean, he was vibrating, but he was like, and I don't know how he kept the ball, you know, so the, the finger needs to be moving in this direction. So you need to prepare your, your fingers and just, and it's a no brainer. This is one thing you could do while watching TV or, or while you're cooking something, you just. And then little by little, then you just begin to do the same thing here, just from first to third, almost like if you're playing um, a harmonic, first as, as a harmonic, very light. And then you begin to press a little bit more and more and more. And then when you, uh, I would say, take, take your time, like a week and a half. By the week and a half, then you begin to put your hand here and you begin to tap. You tap like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And you you see how Italian talk, como va, como esta, you see like. So you do the same thing right here. Tap, 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 and just. And you see, you're moving the finger in this direction and little by little right here, you begin to do, and we're gonna talk about pizza. I, I learned this from Joe Kaminsky, if you don't you know who he is. So. Cheese, 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 cheese. So you go. Well, you need to start nice and relaxed, no, no tension. Pizza, pizza. Black olive, green olive, black olive, green olive. Black olive, green olive, black. And then you go pepperoni, 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 pepperoni. And then little by little, then you go. And this is the way I, I teach my students to do wrist vibrato because also you could do arm vibrato, but this this is the, 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 the word. So you first start, I usually start with the third finger, then the second, 
and the last thing is the fourth. But when you do the fourth, you need to, when if you, there's an exhibition called bo uh, bodies that you see all the, the, the hands and the ligaments and the muscles. And these two fingers are more connected than you think so. So you need to kind of, when you vibrate, you need to kind of like, the four finger can do it all by itself. So you need to kind of like use the support, not like, like this, you know, but so it, it, and, it, and just go, go easy and just, the more you practice it, you, you start practicing it wide and slow, but relax. And little by little, then you just see the. And then also, the, um, let me do it this way. That's okay. I'm trying to make sure I don't crush Ricky. I don't know where he went. But. So, you put, of course, you find you find a, a cloth and you put cover this. You scroll. I'm gonna do it here because I know my hand. And then you start vibrating. So you, you go through the same process, but slow for now um, against the wall. And that will give you, you will feel how the hand needs to move and relax. And little by little, then you just begin to, to make it longer and, and last longer. Like you do like half note, like quarters, you stop, you bring vibrate like a quarter, then half note, uh, triplets. And, but it's just, it, it, it takes a little while. Um, I think I don't, I'm not, I haven't seen that video in a long time, but I, if you look for uh, Vibrato by Joe Kaminsky online, I think you should see that video where he explains the, the black olive olive and the pizza and the cheese and, and, and all this. But yeah, but you have to, you have to go slow but you, for like at least a week or two, just do put, put your violin like a cello and just, one finger, two fingers, three fingers. And actually, and because actually when you play on the cello, the vibrato is more, it's not, see? So you need to, you need to train your hand that this is the angle that you're gonna move. And then little by little. But very relaxed and diligent. You have to be, now, um, also another aspect of, practice that I, a lot of people don't talk about is um, how long and what to practice. Um, I would not recommend practicing no more than 10, 20 minutes or more than half an hour without taking a break. Because remember, all we're dealing here is muscles, just like sports, any, strenuous movement that you should not, so not supposed to do, you did. Oh, and one really cool advice my chiropractor told me <laughs> that you need to stop doing this because he's having a lot of people, musicians specifically, that are having trouble with this muscles. And, and he said that sometimes they, they kind of like, get this, um, this muscle gets uh, debilitated by. So he said, stop texting and holding, and holding, this is the worst thing, holding the phone constantly like this in your hand, like put it somewhere or put a little band around and carry it around, but don't do it. And the worst is the selfie, because when you, when you do this, you, messing with this and you say, you don't want to know how painful and the surgery and all this disease is. I have younger friends that um, play on Broadway and stuff and they have to stop because they don't know how to, they don't relax. They don't uh, take a break from practicing. Um, um, I mean, I'm not saying that you have to stop 
plane and you just play five minutes every day. And so no, practice, but you need to be very aware of how long and how you practice and be careful of the muscles. Also the bow. Um, I, this is, um, how do you call it this? Surgical you tipping. Know, Yes, sorry, yes, exactly. I, a, a bass player that you might see him. Uh, oh my God, I forgot. He's now in Atlanta, and he also babysit dogs. Um, he's. I saw the, him with this, the, the whole bass uh, bow cover with this, and I my hand sweats a little bit now and then. But this is for me is the best thing ever. I can, I can control the bow without having to to grip or with thinking that it's going to follow my hands. But it's very, 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 very true. Okay, somebody woke up or so no. Hey, um, Eric, did you yes. were you talking about somebody named Norman? <laughs> ah, yeah. Well, Norman is my partner. Oh, okay. Because one of um, because Dane was asking who Norman was. So. <laughs> oh no 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 no. He's, he's my partner, but he's. If you see this, any of these programs like um, Long Order SVU, The Good Fight, The Good Wife, Elementary. Or what's the other one? Um, one of the, that one of those cop shows. So that they saw in court. Um, he he always in those shows uh, playing a cop or a lawyer or or something. So, so and, and at the very beginning of tonight, I, I was explaining to everybody, you're not Norman, you're Eric. It's, yes. Yes. Okay. So the reason is that my computer, I have a really super old. Um, Chromebook and it won't let me update um, Zoom. So I remember he had, I was going to do it through the phone, but then he has an Apple. So that is, that is the Apple. All right. I'm going to jump in because we're get, we're about out of time and I wanted to throw some things at you guys. While we're finishing up, I've been trying to keep a running thing in the chat box with the names of the books that Eric has talked about and some of the musicians and stuff. So if you want to take a minute, go look at that because that I think disappears once we hang up. Um, so Eric, can I offer to them, if they have questions for you, they can email them to me and I'll send them to you? Yes, absolutely. Even if you want to call and you don't, you're not doing anything and you want to chat over a cup of coffee, so be it. So this I love is that. And Eric totally means that, by the way. So um, also the video that he showed, that's an entire, it's over two hours. And I found out today it's all on YouTube. You can buy mm -hmm. it, but it is also on YouTube. And I was trying to find the excerpt that he shared. Oh, there's some great stuff. In Another there. one that you should see. This is one of my other favorite violinists. Nadja. Yeah, she, oh my God. The, I will never forget one day. I, I For many years, I lived right behind Lincoln Center, like 20 years. So I would go every day. I was there watching recital at the master class. And then uh, one day he was playing Brooke Concerto. And I was like, oh my God, how did he I knew about this? And I was with groceries coming from the supermarket in shorts, flip flops, not shaven with a little fro. This is like 1991, 92. And I just bought my ticket and I went in, you know, and, and then I know people in the in the Aristotle Hall and then they gave me a house seat. So I was like right in front of her and all this, la, the creme la creme of the music world was there. So just imagine me, all the stuff with shorts in the middle of summer with flip flops and looking like, like a street bomb. And, I went backstage because that was the first time after she caught her pinky. And I was like fascinated by, you know, this, this lady, it was, she was like gonna be like like this, you know, and, and she played the Brooke Concerto. And I tell you, every note she played, she meant, I was like mesmerized by her, her playing. Now she moves a lot and, but her movement is, Organic is natural, but but the passion that she, that she uses to play and the sound, oh my God, is is unbelievable. There is a she she now is teaching in New Orleans in Loyola University. So if you want to go study with her, go talk to her. 
And Jen, let me put in a shout out because she is working very closely with one of my former students, Rebecca Holmes, who's a teacher in New Orleans. Um, and she is somebody, not just Lana Sonnenberg, is somebody who's not only a world famous performer, she cares about giving back to the musical community every way she possibly can. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, so I want to make sure everybody really understood what I think is like the greatest thing about Eric. If you listen to his stories, he never, ever, ever, ever stops learning. And he's a dog lover, but that's beside the point. <laughs> he never, ever, ever stops learning. He's got big gigs. He plays with the famous people. He doesn't care. He's still learning. He still asks for lessons. He still spends time on YouTube watching videos. And um, that's something that I think every one of us could really gather from that. So, um, so Eric, thank you so much for tonight. You are a rock star well, as usual. You. So thank you for inviting me. I love talking. You know, I was as I, I was pre not preparing because I don't actually have to prepare for this. Just, just, you know, I do this all the time. Um, I was thinking that we should uh, because I also wanted to incorporate some of that in this, but it was not going to be enough time to talk about violinists and recordings. Um, you know what? We should schedule another time to do that because I think that a lot of people would really enjoy hearing about that. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of things about violinists and recordings that is like, ooh, especially old recordings like Chrysler. Yeah. Um, yeah. I tell you, it's so much. There's so much, so much to do. Very little time. So you guys pay attention because if Eric and I can pull that off at some point. I will put that on the Huffmaker Violins Facebook page. Um, and you could just keep it. I would create an event. Um, speaking of could, events. Sorry. And I have my uh, a, a sound cloud. I don't have a website yet, but I um, I don't know. For many years, I, I, I see how people steal stuff from each other and so forth. So that's what I haven't made a website. But I have a, a page on SoundCloud where you could hear some of my classical recordings and um, some Christmas stuff that I recorded. Will you type that in the chat box? Do you know how to do yeah. that? <laughs> I say he's on a strange computer. That's why. I or yeah. Um, what's so? Uh, if you're, yeah, you're, you're, you're type my complete name. And... It's SoundCloud. Just so everybody knows, that's the website. Like if you type my name or go on SoundCloud and type my name, and you'll you'll find me. All right. Speaking of events, next week, same bat time, same bat channel, we have, um, I, um, sorry, I closed all my notes because I was enjoying myself so much. So, um, secrets of excellent vibrato. So next week's session is nothing but vibrato. Mm -hmm. And William Herzog is a professional violinist and he's going to be here. And um, I will also jump in for cellos and basses. So it is, it will be appropriate for everybody. And um, we want you all to be here. If you need the link, shoot me a message on Facebook. It's there, but you can also shoot me there or email me at huffmakerviolins.com. And if you want something forwarded to Eric, I will forward it to him. He's on Facebook. He shares a lot of really cool stuff. So And Instagram too. Right? And Instagram too. Sorry, I keep forgetting. I'm old, so I forget how cool it is. <laughs> All right, you guys, I am going to stop the recording because I try and keep this on time. Um, but I just, you can't tell because they're all muted and half of them don't have cameras on, but people are clapping for you. And, oh, thank um, you, thank you. Do you yeah. want to hear the story that I couldn't talk earlier? Not, not yet, hold on.